unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be
morning, Parkview. As we come to this time of communion, I am reminded of the table in the back that says, do this in remembrance of me. Now, this may come across rude, but I think most of you are like me. Sometimes we become callous at this time. We take communion half-heartedly, but not today. Today, I want us to remember what Christ did. The God, the creator of the world, told water to stop and land to grow, the one who placed the sun, moon, and stars, the one who created men from the dirt, chose to leave his throne and walk on the ground to be created, and he chose to allow the men he created to beat, humiliate, and torture him by being flogged by whips, having a crown of thorns crushed into his skull, being spat on and cursed at. And then while hanging on a cross, having a spear pierced into his side. And that is only half of it. The other half is while Jesus is on the cross, we read in Matthew that he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is experiencing God's full wrath. Wrath that was intended for you and I due to our sin. Jesus is forsaken, abandoned. The holiness of God is removed. And Jesus genuinely goes to hell back for us. For three days, Satan thought he won, that hell had conquered. But as you know, the stone was rolled away, and the God who created man became the God who conquered death and resurrected, so that we too may conquer death. That is why we do this in remembrance of that sacrifice. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. As we come to this time of prayer, um, one thing I want to focus on is Memorial Day is tomorrow. Um, we are so blessed in this country and we take for granted the freedoms that we have. And one of those freedoms is to be able to congregate like we do every Sunday in worship. So as we, as we come to pray, let's, let's be, just be thankful for those sacrifices that was made. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm thankful that I live in a nation that I can come and I can worship you every Sunday. Lord, we are thankful for the men and women who fought and died for those freedoms. Lord, I pray they be with them and their families. In your son's name, amen. I heard a story about this guy named Bobby, and he had his mom over for dinner while he was in college. Well, Bobby had just moved in with this girl named Allison, and mom was a little concerned, okay? But, but Bobby assured her, Nothing's going on. We're just, we're just living together because of rent. It's purely platonic. It's all good, just trying to make things a little easier for everybody. You know, these are living, get, get with the modern times, Mom. Well, Mom, her mom's sense had kind of gone on because Allison was really, really pretty. Okay, but, but Bobby said, hey, hey, we're just doing this to save money. It's all good. Well, Mom was still a little concerned. They, they, she goes over. She has dinner with them. Everything is going fine. And then... Mom looks over at Allison and says, Allison, uh, could, I, could I look at your watch? It's kind of pretty. I, I'm thinking about buying one like that. So Allison takes off the watch, gives it to her. They go on with dinner. Um, everything went great. Well, a couple days later, Allison comes back to Bobby and says, hey, have you seen my watch? Um, I, obviously, I'm not saying your mom stole it or anything, but she was the last one that had it. So it maybe, maybe she dropped her purse or something. So Bobby, being the dutiful son and very considerate 
son he was, sent his mom an email. And in the email, he writes, Mom, obviously, we're not accusing you of anything, but the fact remains you were the last one to have Allison's watch. Uh, Do you know what maybe had happened to it? The mom, being the passive-aggressive Karen that she might have been as well, decides to wait a couple days to send an email back. And in her email, she writes, Bobby, obviously... I'm not saying that you're sleeping with Allison, but the fact remains, had she been sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the watch on the pillow where I left it. That's terrible. Sorry. That's awful. Uh, Obviously, that story's not true, but the fact remains, we've all been caught, haven't we? We've all been caught doing something we shouldn't be doing. We've all been caught in sin. Now, I think that there's two camps when this happens. The first camp is... You get caught, and it's devastating. It's awful, and you don't know how you're going to recover, and you're not even sure if the grace of God is enough. The other camp, though, is the, I've been caught in my sin, and I don't know why they think it's such a big deal. This is, I don't even know if I need the grace of God. This was such a small little thing. Well, today's story, I think, addresses both of these camps, and then what we do. But the reality of life, the reality of life, all right, here's some preaching. We all sin. No amens? <laughs> we all sin. And here's the thing. It's terrible. It is terrible. Everybody sins. It's what you do afterward that's the difference between life and death. And today, we're going to talk about a guy that got caught. A guy that got caught pretty red-handed in a pretty terrible sin. We've been going over these heroes of faith. And this guy is considered one of the greatest heroes of faith of all. And he was also called a guy, a man after God's own heart. Now, how could a man after God's own heart get caught in a terrible sin? Well, maybe it's not the sinning that makes you a man after God's own heart, but what you do after it. And of course, that guy that we're talking about today is David. And if you don't know the whole story of David and how he sinned, you can look that up in 2 Samuel chapter 11, but I'm just going to give you the bullet points today. But David, he was one of the kings of Israel, considered the greatest king of Israel. He also considered a really good dude. Well, he fell and he fell hard. He had an affair with a woman, Bathsheba. He used his power, he used his authority, he used his position of the king of Israel to domineer over a woman. Completely and totally bad. That's awful. But to make it sting a little bit more, her husband was one of David's inner circle. One of his mighty men. One of the guys that was devoted to him. Well, Bathsheba gets pregnant. David doesn't want to get caught. So using his power and his authority and his position, he decides once again, we're going to concoct this plan so that I can cover up my sin. Well, that plan doesn't work. So David goes to plan B, using his power, his position, and his authority. Unjustly, he orchestrates the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, murders him. They have the child. She... She gets pregnant. David, here's the thing, he ends up looking like the really good guy, right? Because nobody knows what's going on. He brings her into his home. Everybody thinks, oh, David, he's a great guy. But then she has the child, and that's where we're at right now. So, a year from now. See, back in those days, back in Bible times, it took nine months from doing the deed to having the kid, and that's where we're standing right now. I learned that in biology class, so here we go. All right, so Nathan, the prophet, comes up to David and says, I want to have an audience with you. Nathan was David's preacher at the time. Um, Nathan says, something has happened in your kingdom, and you need to know about this. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, this is what Nathan tells David. I want you to remember, nobody knows, except for maybe Bathsheba, and maybe a few other accomplices of what David had done. Nathan says, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little tiny lamb, which he had bought with his own money. And it grew up with him. 
and with his children. It used to eat from their table and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, the daughter, that may be a little sketchy, we understand, but you get the point. It was, it was like a pet to him, dear to the family. Well, a certain day, relatives from the rich man, they come over to his place. And the rich man, more sheep than he knows what to do with. What's he decide to do? He doesn't want to use one of his sheep. That was below him. So he goes to his neighbor. And because he can, he callously takes his neighbor's little pet sheep, butchers it, feeds it to his relatives. And when David hears this, he is livid. David says in verse 5, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, this man what he did, he must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, and because he did such a thing, he had no pity. Then Nathan looks at David, and in the most direct application of a sermon ever, he says, David, you are that man. And I always wonder how long the pause must have been between that statement and the next. Have you ever been sitting in a sermon and you felt like the preacher was talking directly to you? Well, that's what's going on here because David is the only guy in the room. The conviction was inescapable. David's actions were inexcusable. David had condemned himself to die out of his own mouth. And then Nathan says in verse 7, this is what the Lord of God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave all of Israel and Judah. And if this had all been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, and the son born to you will die. Guys, everybody sins. But it's what you do afterward that determines life and death. And this, this is what makes David a man after God's own heart. So when we're exposed to our sin, someone confronts us, our conscience smites us, we get caught, we normally reply and respond in one of four ways. Okay, first thing we do is we hide. We deny it. We tell people, you know what, that happened a long time ago, but but it's not a problem anymore. I'm afraid, and I'm pretty sure there are people sitting in these seats right here today that there's a sin in your life you hope no one ever finds out about. So you come to church and we put on our plastic Christian smiles and we hold our huge leather-bound Bibles with golden boss names on the side. We pretend nothing's wrong. And we sit down and we take little selfies in church and we say hashtag blessed because we never want anybody to find out. We hide it. We also rationalize it. We explain why our sin really isn't that big of a deal. It's not really hurting everybody, anybody. No, everybody's doing it. I can't help it. My desires are just way too strong. I was born this way, right? So we rationalize it. We also blame shift. It's not really my fault. You have no idea the pressure I have at work and the the weirdos I work with. It was my boss. It's my family. It's my kids. However it might be, it's it's never my fault. It's someone else's. Or we can do what David did, and we can repent. And we can recognize the awfulness of our sin, and we can throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And thankfully for us, David did this, and he wrote down his words. He wrote down his prayer, and we find that in Psalm 51. Remember that a man or a woman of God is not someone that never sins. A man or a woman of God 
is a man or a woman that knows how to repent. And I'm afraid that many of us, this is something that doesn't come naturally to us, does it? And that's the beauty of Psalm 51. We can learn from David and we can let God's grace be greater than our sin. So we're going to look at three essential elements to repentance that's found in Psalm 51. So if you have your Bibles or if you want to look on the screen, we're going to be starting Psalm 51 right from the beginning, verse 1. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. So what's the basis of David's plea? The mercy of God. And where does he find it? In God's steadfast love. Well, and this gives us our first basis of gospel-centered repentance. Gospel-centered repentance makes its only hope the mercy of God. See, I want you to notice what's missing here. See, when I'm confronted in my sin, I tend to have a different reaction. And David doesn't do that. See, I'd have a reaction tell, telling God, you know, these are all the things good that I've done. See, David doesn't start the prayer and say, hey, God, 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 I know this is bad, but remember that Goliath guy? Remember, there was only one person in Israel that stood up to him, and that was me. That's got to count for something, right? Or, hey, look at my track record as a king. I've done great. It's amazing. David doesn't do that. David also doesn't try to rationalize his sin. He doesn't say to God, God, you know what? (laughs) These people, they're hard-headed. I mean, we've had trouble with them all the way back to Moses. Moses could never get them to do anything that he, you wanted them to do, and I can't either. It's just the way. It's the pressure. It's what's going on. David doesn't say, I've got all these wives. And all of them, for the last three straight weeks, have all had headaches. i got desires. He doesn't do any of that. David also doesn't try to bargain with God. Have you ever tried to put your repentance on credit and say, you know what, God, I'll tell you what, um, I screwed up, but if you can just let me out this one, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll read my Bible every day. I'll be a better husband. I'll be a better whatever. But David doesn't do any of those things. David doesn't do it, but it seems like this is the stuff that we end up doing over and over. David makes his sole hope God's mercy. But there's something inside me that says, is this really enough I want to show God why he needs to forgive me, why he's obligated to do this. I need to separate myself from the pack, let God know how much better I am than other people. I need to let God know how much he owes me mercy. It's not the way you do it. Is God's mercy great enough that you can throw yourself completely and totally on it? See, lots of religions teach that we need the mercy of God, but only Christianity Only the gospel tell us that we need to throw ourselves on God's mercy and nothing else. No one who has ever made the mercy of God their sole basis of hope has ever been turned away from God. The life of Jesus shows this. The mercy of God is the one thing that you can take an unlimited risk on. Gentiles, prostitutes, tax collectors, the unclean, diseased, the thief on the cross... They all threw themselves themselves on the mercy of God, and they were not denied. But there were ones people that were turned away. And who were turned away? Those people that went to God and said, God, because of what I've done, you need to show me mercy. You're obligated to show me mercy. Look at the rich young ruler. See, being delivered from our sin is easy. But being delivered from your self-justification, that's the hard part. See, before God can save you from your sin, God needs to save you from all the reasons you think you should be saved from your sin. Before God can save you from your sin, God needs to save you from your self-righteousness. Our sin separates us from God. Our self-righteousness keeps us from God. Why should God be gracious to you? Is it because of anything that you have done? Because if that's the case, you're missing the point entirely. 
But if you throw yourself completely and totally on the mercy of God, you're going to find that God has abundant goodness, grace, and mercy for you. So that's the good news. Saving us from our sin, that's the easy part. Saving us from our self-righteousness, that's where it gets a little hairy. David goes on, verse 3 says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. See, we see that gospel-centered repentance... It owns that sin is deeply embedded in who we are. We own it. We don't excuse it. Have you ever had someone, they come up and they've confronted you, and you know that they're right, but you feel yourself pushing back anyway? And so we go through those four stages that I was talking about earlier. We start to blame shift. You know, you say, problem, it, it's, it's work. It's all these people are causing me trouble. That, that's the real problem here. We, <clears throat> we start to deny it. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever had that conversation where someone comes up and they say, hey, I've got a little problem with you, and you fake the phone call? It's like, oh, hey, it's, it's my wife calling. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit later. Or... I think one of our very favorite things to do, someone comes up and says, well, hey, you know, I've got this. You just say, wait one, right, one second right there. Let's talk. Look, how about you? Look at what you've done. You know, you're a hypocrite to bring that up to me because the best way for me to avoid my sin is to talk about yours, right? David, though, David does the complete opposite he says, yeah, I'm a sinner, but you don't even know the half of it. And then he says in verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in inequity, and in sin did my mother convince me. He says, sin? Oh, yeah, sin. It comes natural to me. I was born like this. I don't even have to practice. I'm so good at it. And that's the truth about us all, isn't it? If we just admit it, no one ever had to teach me to be a lying, awful, self-centered, complete, and total jerk. Just ask Tracy. She knows. But I do a good job of hiding it. Or at least I think I do a good job of hiding it, maybe. But every once in a while, every once in a while, you see what's in my heart, and it comes out. And I see it in other people as well. We all see it. It's not really an anomaly. Our hearts, our hearts are corrupted. You know, I see it in my kids. I love my kids dearly, but I see it in them, especially when they're a little bit of babies. You know, people that don't have babies and grandparents are the only people that think babies are cute and cuddly all the time, right? So if you've had babies, you understand that they are awful little lying sinners, right? They only want their own will all the time, and they're only thinking about themselves, correct? You know, feed me, I want to do this, no, I don't want to go to bed. You ever try to get a toddler to bed? What do they do? No, 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 and you're trying to push him down there, and that's just what happens, right? There's this movie called Yes Day, and, the, and as a parent, I struggle sometimes too. You know, how many of you, the number one word in your house is no because those little selfish, little lying sinner babies out there. <laughs> and in Yes Day, that was kind of the whole premise of this. They want to say yes. And as parents, we do want to say yes. We want to see the best in our little kids. Paige, I love Paige Death. I love the woman that she's grown into. But when she was four years old, you know what I really wanted? I wanted her to have her little four-year-old hands when I walked downstairs uh, when she was a little four-year-old. And, and she'd be reading her Bible. And I walk down and she say, Dad, good morning. I made you breakfast. And right now I'm reading John, trying to figure out how to get closer with God. No, that doesn't happen, does it? No, I leave them alone for five minutes. They're burning down the backyard. And I say, what happens? And they're all pointing at each other and say, they did it, they did it, they did it. And no one will take responsibility. Amen? Yeah, all right. That's what happens. We're all born of inequity, aren't we? Every kid Every person, we're all born a rebel. You may not completely understand original sin, right? But none of us deny that it's not there, correct? Ernest Becker, he is a Jewish agnostic, also 
a cultural anthropologist, wrote a whole lot of books, but in his books, his early books, he would write about how the basic human nature was good. That, you know, we're all good, but what makes us bad is our environment. It's the inequality of society, lack of education, all these things. Well, his very last book, he had a turn, change of heart. In the preface of this book, he wrote this. He says, I'm now looking at humanity full in the face for the very first time. In my previous works, I failed to see how truly vicious human behavior is. I've been caught up trying to sustain the enlightenment myth that mankind is basically good. It's just not true. Guys, I realize other people have sinned against you. And I know people have contributed to your sin. But you're not going to get anywhere until you own it. See, you're not deprived. You are depraved. You might say, well, Brian, I just, I got, I got caught up in the wrong crowd. I'm going to say, no, no, no. You are the wrong crowd. That's why you love being around the wrong crowd so much. And that's why they like being around you, because they're all the wrong crowd. Quit blaming someone else. David says, my problem is not that in a moment of weakness I committed adultery. No, he says, my problem is that I am an adulterer. And what came out was what tr was true of my heart. So let's look at the next verse. He says, against you and you only, he's talking to God here, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Is that true? Did David only sin against God? How about Bathsheba? Did he sin against her? How about Uriah the Hittite? I, I think that he might have something to say about that as well, right? I kind of have this picture of David when he dies going to heaven. And in God's kind of divine sense of humor, who do you suppose would be waiting for David as he's walking towards the pearly gates? And I, I would assume that's probably going to be Uriah the Hittite, right? And so as David's walking up there, Uriah says, hey, David, we're about to go into the pearly gates where there is no violence and only peace there. But we're not there yet. <laughs> we got a little talking to do. So, all right. Now, I know that this might be hard to explain, that he's only sinned against God. And this is a little deep, but this is the heart of the entire thing. This is the heart of repentance. See, gospel-centered repentance is directed first towards God. It's directed first towards God. There's two important reasons why David says that. Number one, he realizes that his sin began first and foremost against God, and all of our sin is directed ultimately towards God. See, David says, why, why did I need Bathsheba? Why did I have this incredible like, suction towards that sin? Well, he says, you know what? I craved Bathsheba's arms because, God, I didn't have yours. I desired Bathsheba's beauty, God, because I didn't have your beauty. All of our sin starts with a broken relationship with God. Why are we not satisfied with what God has given us? Why do we get jealous of other people? Why do we see their life and think, I really wish I had their life. I wish I had their car. I wish I had their money. I wish I had their girlfriend, their job, whatever it might be. And when we feel that, what are we really saying to God? We're saying, God, I don't trust what you've given me. I don't trust your plan for my life. See, David, he also realizes that God was the most important one he defended. He realizes that God was the most important one he defended. Now, what he'd done to Uriah, it was, it was horrible. It was despicable. But what David did to God was so much worse, believe it or not. And this may be hard for some of us to see, but that's the heart of repentance. We're always focused on what we've done to the other person. But do we ever think about what our sin does to God? And let's just sit back. What did our sin do to God? What did he have to do to make our sin right? He had to send his son to a bloody and brutal death on the cross 
for us. That's how bad our sin was. Stop and think about that for a moment. What does the cross, what does the cross tell you about the impact of your sin towards God? Jesus died not because of what your sin did to your neighbor. Jesus died because of what your sin does to God. And when was the last time we got emotional about that? And I'm not saying embarrassed or you feel bad just because you got caught. Because do we understand the heart of God? And when we understand the heart of God, then we can understand the impact of our sin towards him. And then, and only then, can we understand that we can only throw ourselves completely and totally on the mercy of God. Not because of anything we have done, but because we serve a God whose grace is greater than all our sin. See, Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them, they are the ones that find mercy. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these stories, these heroes of faith, and help us to understand that, that, that we're not perfect. And when we screw up, not just when we get caught, but at all times, when we sin against you, that we recognize that it grieves you and that we come to you when we throw ourselves on your mercy. Help us do that. Help us to understand that, that you're a loving and a gracious God who gives mercy with your steadfast love. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Parkview. I have some announcements for you today, and it's going to be a short one. First off, it's summer, and we have no official scheduled youth meetings, but stay tuned for some pop-up events. On July 11th through the 14th, the high school student group will be going on a canoe trip. The cost of that will be $90, and if you're not able to pay for it, talk to Brian or one of the other youth leaders, and we can get you hooked up. That's all I have for you guys this week. Bye!